Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So today is May 9th in Auckland, New Zealand, 2020, giving class over Zoom. And this is about seeing Krishna everywhere in his energy. We're looking at Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 27, Understanding Material Nature, Text 12. And I will share my screen. All right. Ita jalasta abasa. Ita jalasta abasa. Stala stena vadrishyate. Stala stena vadrishyate. Svabhasena tata suryo. Svabhasena tata suryo. Jala stena divistita. Jala stena divistita. How do I make it do what I want it to do? Ah, there we go. Yata, as Jalasta, situated on water. Abhasaha, a reflection. Stalastena, situated on the wall. Avadristite, is perceived. Swa Abhasena, by its reflection. Tata, in that way. Suryaha, the sun. Jalastena, situated on the water. Divi, in the sky. Stita, situated. So you notice in this verse over and over again, we have sta, stala, right? Stitaha. Stena. This is where something is staying. Uh, it's very much related to the English word stay or stable. So this is where we find the Lord. Where is he staying? We would all like to find the Lord, yes? Everybody wants to find the Lord. Like George Harrison said, everybody is looking for Krishna. Some don't know that they are, but they are. So I think... All of us reading the Bhagavatam, we definitely are looking for Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada's translation. The presence of the Supreme Lord can be realized just as the sun is realized. First as a reflection on water and again as a second reflection on the wall of a room. Although the sun itself is situated in the sky. Srila Prabhupada's purport. The example given herewith is perfect. The sun is situated in the sky, far, far away from the surface of the earth, but its reflection can be seen in a pot of water in the corner of a room. The room is dark and the sun is far away in the sky, but the sun's reflection on the water illuminates the darkness of the room. A pure devotee can realize the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in everything by the reflection of his energy. In the Vishnu Purana, it is stated that as the presence of fire is understood by heat and light, so the Supreme Personality of Godhead, although one without a second, is perceived everywhere by the diffusion of his different energies. It is confirmed in the Ishopanishad that the presence of the Lord is perceived everywhere by the liberated soul, just as the sunshine and the reflection can be perceived everywhere, although the sun is situated far away from the surface of the globe. Yata jalasta abhasaha, stala stena vadrishite, swa basena tata suryo, jalastena divistitaha. The presence of the Supreme Lord can be realized just as the sun is realized first as a reflection on water and again as a second reflection on the wall of a room, although the sun itself is situated 
in the sky. So what I thought we could do is go to some reflections that we put together in a book. I worked with this devotee, uh, Kamala Sita, for several years, putting together a book of how we could meditate on the Lord and find the presence of the Lord. This verse is all about finding the presence of the Lord through his energies. And this book is supposed to be published by BBT Africa. I'm not sure how soon that's going to be, uh, but hopefully by the end of the year. We have some beautiful, beautiful artwork that was done by uh, Nadi Bihari Darling. And that's a second generation devotee that's going to go into the book. So I thought that we could read some of these meditations here of how we can find Krishna in his energy. So we can just take some at random. This is about earth. So how we can meditate on Krishna in earth and in solid objects. So here our meditation is, this is very nice because it was just Nasinga Dave's appearance day. The earth attracts not only through gravity, but also through magnetic energy. We can remember how the Saint Prahlad declared that his mind and heart were drawn to Krishna as naturally as iron, iron to a magnet. So all of us use magnets, yes, uh, in our life. We all have some kind of gadgetry that has some sort of magnet in it, some kind of magnetic closure, or we have refrigerator magnets. And we can, whenever we're using these magnets, we can think about how the law says that we're attracted to the Lord, just like iron is attracted to a magnet. The same is true whenever we are finding our directions. Right? We can think about how we have a compass. It works with the magnetic pole and how the earth is also attracting us with this magnetism, which is also Krishna. All right, let's pick another one at random from water. So actually this one was the meditation that started me on this journey. Many, many years ago, I was in London and uh, one devotee had taken me to a swimming pool in London. Most people don't swim like in rivers and lakes in the ocean in London because it's so cold. But she had taken me to a swimming pool and, and I was chanting while I was swimming. And I was thinking this water is so soft, but it's also very strong. Oh, Krishna's also soft. And he's very strong. Uh, so that we have this softness of water, which is, uh, reminds us of the softness of Krishna. Right? And his body is so soft, it changes color. It said that you just touch Krishna with a little leaf. I mean, my body only changes color if you push on it hard. But Krishna's body changes color very, very easily. Right? And this, the softness of Krishna's body is one of the udipans, one of the stimulus for the devotees to love him. So not only is his form soft, but also his sentiments are very soft. And he's got a very soft heart. He's, he's very loving. He's very giving. And the fact that water's liquidity, it reminds us that the Lord's heart is always melting in love for his devotees, right? especially when the Lord takes the form of his chief devotee, when he appears as Lord Chaitanya, then his heart is melting with compassion. And this, this concept of this melting and liquidity, we can be reminded of whenever we're dealing with the soft liquidity of water, right? That, that is this mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay, let's pick one at random here from fire. So, uh, that the warmth of fire is often associated with life. Right? If something's alive, it has warmth. That's one of the ways, right, if uh, the doctors, the medics want to check, is somebody alive? They check their bodily temperature, right? And Krishna is saying, I am the heat in fire. So wherever we're experiencing any kind of warmth, then immediately we can be remembered. You're not seeing the shared screen? Well, that's all right. I'm, you don't have to, absolutely have to see it. That's fine. Um, but I could stop sharing and share it again, if you like. Um, 
I stop sharing and then share again. So hopefully that'll work. So whenever Krishna says he's the heat and fire, so I'm sure whatever room we're in right now, whatever place we're in right now, that uh, has some warmth in it, right? If there wasn't any warmth in the room we were in, then we would be dead very quickly. Uh, what we need next to air is warmth, is proper temperature. So if we can become aware for a moment of the warmth in our room, huh? And that to notice that feeling of warmth in our room and that that heat is Krishna. Huh? So that's life itself, that the Lord is alive. He's the source of all life. That this heat that we're experiencing is indicative that the Lord is alive. I remember we had this uh, here in North Carolina where I'm right now. We had this one devotee who gave us a video for our Gurukula about the origin of the universe, which is interesting. I mean, who took a video of the origin of the universe? But it was obviously a simulation of what somebody imagined as the origin of the universe. And in the beginning, there was this, you know, very scholarly looking gentleman who came out and said, the origin of the universe is a cold, impersonal machine. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> uh, no, actually, Krishna is, is warm. It's warm. And warmth is associated not only with life, but also with love. Right? Somebody gives us a warm embrace, which we're not doing a whole lot now with COVID-19. Uh, but we can feel this life and love of Krishna in the heat of fire. Okay, so let's go on to air. I'm going to pick one. Uh, so here we have how the Lord is breathing out universes. And he breathes in and they re-enter his body. And we're living in that. We're living in a universe that's riding on the Lord's breath. What a thing to think about. You know, when we are breathing in and out, we can think, wow, you know, there are some little entities that are being carried in my breath. And this whole universe is being carried on the breath of the Lord. Okay, what about space? Let's go to one in space. Okay. Um, so here we have a meditation that different living beings define space according to their consciousness. Just like I'm, I'm sitting right next to my altar and I don't see me right now, but the last couple of days on my altar, because I bring in fresh flowers from the garden, there'll be little ants. I mean, really, the little teeny, teeny, tiny ants, you know, probably just like a couple millimeters long. And their perception of space is very different from my perception of space. Right? If an ant's walking on the road, it doesn't perceive that that road leads to another road, to another road, and so forth. And in a similar way, how we perceive the presence of God depends on our level of consciousness, depends on our level of awareness. So the road is right there, but the ant doesn't really see what it is or where it goes, just like God is all around me. And, and yet my perception of him depends on my level of consciousness. We can think about that when we think about how different people perceive space, right? Or I have a, a great grandson who can't, he's not mobile yet. You know, he can't turn, even turn over yet. So if you go out of the room or you even go out of his line of sight, from his perspective, you've just disappeared into, you know, some alternative reality. So his perception of space and mind is very different. All right, we're looking at meditations in the Bhagavad Gita. And these are all the things that Krishna says, I am. The taste of water, the light of the sun, light of the moon, splendor of fire, sound in ether. Let's go to sound in ether. So, uh, in the sound of ether, so Srila Prabhupada gave a very interesting uh, talk on this. And he says, this was in a lecture on Bhagavad Gita 7-8 in 1974 in Bombay. Prabhupada says, you can remember Krishna otherwise, even hearing some sound in the cut in the ether. Sound is produced by the ether. So many sounds we are hearing. If you simply remember this sloka of Bhagavata, that Shabda, any sound, Hare Krishna's sound is transcendental. That's all right. But if you don't like Hare Krishna sound, you take any sound. Any sound is also. That is coming from the original sound. Simply it is covered by maya. 
What is the difference between spiritual and material? Everything is spiritual, sarva kalami dham brahma. But when it's covered by maya, it is material. That's all. And what is maya? Forgetfulness of Krishna. So that means any sound I hear is Krishna. And it's just a question of remembering. So let's pay attention right now. What sounds are in our environment? So I hear kind of a very distant roar of some cars that are on a nearby highway. It's not very many cars out now, but I can hear that, right? So the vehicles on the road, I mean, mentioning here electric tools, repetitive sounds, they can remind us of the instruments that are playing in the, for the dancing of the Lord with the gopis or the dancing of the Lord with the cowherd boys. And when we hear birds singing, I'm, I'm in a very rural area, there's a lot of birds singing. So they can remind us of the glorification of the Lord by his various associates in his kingdom. So any sounds that we hear can remind us of some sound in the spiritual world. Okay, let's find some more here. Um, oh, the penances of all ascetics. Let's look at that. So to do penance, what does it mean to do penance? You know, the word penance is not a very common word in the modern world but it means to make something wrong right, to try to restore balance to a relationship or situation after we did something that upsets that balance. We want to fix something that we did or maybe something in ourselves that caused pain or disturbance to others. So saying, I'm sorry, giving an apology is a kind of penance. And uh, we know it's a kind of penance because of how difficult it is for most people to do that. I, I recently offered an apology to one devotee who said, you know, you're the first ISKCON leader who's ever offered me an apology. And I thought, oh, that's not very good. And, you know, it, it's a hard thing to do. We find, you know, political leaders, business leaders, they, they really struggle to take responsibility and to do penance for what they've done wrong. You know, they, they find out that they poison people, you know, through their, chemical processes in their industrial plant and they don't want to pay anybody compensation and so forth, right? And Krishna says that of penances, he is the penance of all ascetics. So we could ask, well, what's so special about the ascetics? And these are people in, in any religious tradition, you know, we have our brahmacharis, vanaprastas, and sannyasis, but in, in every tradition, there's uh, monks, nuns, priests, and, and people who are performing asceticism. And they're people that offer their whole life as an act of penance. Right? The, an ascetic is someone who's realized that, that their own state of forgetfulness is an offense. I mean, imagine like right now, I'm staying in someone else's house. It's, imagine if I forget that, that it's her house. I forget that I'm staying in someone else's house. I just start dealing with it as if it was my house. So that would be very offensive. So when we're working in the world as if Krishna is not there, that's quite an offense. And an ascetic says, I'm going to dedicate my entire life, everything in my life, to trying to say I'm sorry, to trying to make up for my mood of forgetfulness of Krishna, for my mood of rebellion against Krishna. And it, therefore, their whole life is a way of repenting. And not just to say, I'm sorry, but to try to restore the balance. Uh, in, if we really say we're sorry, we like to offer some sort of retribution. You know, if someone's hurt me, I want them to try to, to, to restore the relationship, to balance things in some way. And Krishna says of all of the things that aesthetics do, he's most present in their penances. He says he actually is their penance. So we could say, how is it that Krishna is actually the penance of aesthetics if he has never have to apologize for anything? Of course, sometimes in Leela, Krishna apologizes to his mother or uh, to the gopis and so forth. Um, but Krishna comes to this world whenever there's an imbalance of religiosity. So he comes to save the Pandavas, to kill the sons of Dhritarashtra, to as Varaha to save Bhumi and kill Hiranyaksha, as Ramachandra to kill Ravana and save Sita. And these are all imbalances in the world. And in one sense, the material energy is part of Krishna. So when he comes, he comes to restore a balance that's part of his own energy. 
So we could say he's penitent himself because he's the ultimate restorer. Well, here in America, we're going to have Mother's Day in a couple of days. So let's go to how Krishna says, I am the mother. So at the present time in history, if someone describes God as a supreme mother, the assumption is that the supreme being must be feminine. But Krishna is both the original male and the ultimate mother. So how, what is this? How does this make sense? So, of course, Krishna has his incarnation as a woman, Mohini Murti, who's the ultimate womanly form that Prakriti worships, according to Sanatana Goswami, in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita. Huh? And the great saints that explain that being complete, God is both male and female, Lakshmi Narayan, Sita Ram, Radha Krishna, and so forth. And these couples are one in their identity, although they have different pastimes for enjoyment. So we're part of Krishna. Our bodies were formed and nourished from our mother's body. As the mother loves regardless of defects or crimes of the child, so Krishna always loves us. Okay? Our bodies are made. It's it said that we are in the Krishna's abdomen. Huh? Yes. And Krishna's loving us just, just like our mother loves, so much better even. Right? So many species of life, the mother will sacrifice her health, her safety, even her life for her children. And Krishna will voluntarily gives everything to us. Right outside my daughter's house next door, there's a mother, Robin, who has her eggs in a nest. And, you know, she has to eat. The father, Robin, doesn't usually feed me the mother during while she's sitting on the eggs, but he's guarding. He's in the area guarding and she has to leave her eggs to eat, but you can't leave too long, right? Because then they'll get cold and the babies will die. So she's always conscious of taking care of her babies. And Krishna's like that, always taking care of us just like a mother because we've come from his own form. Uh, Prabhupada writes a very fascinating commentary in the uh, verse where Krishna says, I'm the mother. He writes, in the material existence, we create different relationships with different living entities who are nothing but Krishna's marginal energy. Under the creation of Prakriti, some of them appear as our father, mother, grandfather, creator, etc., but actually they are parts and parcels of Krishna. As such, these living entities who appear to be our father, mother, etc., are nothing but Krishna. In this verse, the word data means creator. Not only are our father and mother parts and parcels of Krishna, but the creator, grandmother and grandfather, etc., are also Krishna. Actually, every any living entity being part and parcel of Krishna is Krishna. <laughs> so that is, this is an astonishing statement where Prabhupada's speaking about the oneness. This is in the purport to Bhagavad Gita 917. And this way we know that not only does Krishna personify the beauty and qualities of a natural mother, but in the love we receive from our own mothers, we can understand something of Krishna. Okay. Um, let's see. What about the refuge? Okay. So a refuge is a, a place of shelter. A place of safety, of protection. So like right now in this violent in this virus pandemic, we're being told shelter in place, right? Stay where you are, find a shelter. So there's so much we consider our refuge. We have physically, we have buildings, screens in our windows. Of course, I remember when I first went to New Zealand and there were no screens in the windows. And I said, does that mean you have no mosquitoes? They said, we have a lot of mosquitoes. And I said, well, why don't you have screens in your windows? Our, our clothing is a kind of shelter. The, we maybe we put sun block on our skin or lotion on our skin. Those are a kind of refuge. Places that have food, places that have water are a kind of refuge. Um, we also may feel a kind of refuge in our intelligence, our knowledge, our skills, or so forth, right, that we have. Uh, we can think that all of these refuge, uh, all of these different places we have as a refuge in our life, they're all fallible soldiers. Right? Our buildings, our clothes, our skin cream, our intelligence, they're, they're all going to fail. And if Krishna doesn't agree, they won't give us any protection. They say, Mari Krishna Rake K, Rake Krishna Mari K. Krishna wants to kill you, no one can save you. If Krishna wants to save you, no one can kill you. And even though all of our material refuges are 
shaky, they're insubstantial, but there's a feeling we get when we're going to them, like a baby in arms, right? You pick up a little, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of us have held a, a young baby and that, that feeling, right, that we're the refuge for this little baby with a shelter. And that feeling when we are sheltered by something, you know, you come out of a, a cold rainstorm into your house and shake off the water and snuggle up by a fire, right, with a blanket around you, that feeling of being sheltered, that if we can multiply that by millions of times, billions of times, some sense of how Krishna is the refuge, right? And Prabhupada writes in his purport to 321.17, he says, devotees boldly take to that shelter, which is like an umbrella against the sun of repeated birth and death. All right, so what other one should we take? Um, let's see. Let's take patience in women. So Krishna says he is patience in women. And in all the world's sacred writings, it's stated that women should voluntarily be subordinate to a man. And that's true in all the great religious traditions, although people, I suppose, today don't like that very much. Uh, and one reason I don't like that very much is that men are imperfect in so many ways, even if they're well-intended, still are going to make a lot of mistakes. And, uh, and often they're not even well-intended. <laughs> they may be ill-intended. They may be contaminated by lust, anger, greed, and so many other things. And yet there are women who are patient with them. Uh, they give sage advice along with service, like we find uh, Mandodari gave Ravana good advice. Antari gave Dudarastra good advice. And this patience of women, that's Krishna, right? So like Antari, she's one of the most chaste women in history. Should we mute somebody here? And she was begging Dudarastra, please make peace with the Pandavas, please take care of the Pandavas. Uh, and she was very, very patient with Dudarastra, even though he never listened to her. And in a similar way, Krishna is very patient with us. And Krishna is the voice of our conscience. Uh, don't do that. That's not a good idea. Or why don't you do that? Help that person. No, you shouldn't eat that thing. You shouldn't go there. Right? And also he's the words of scripture that tell us what's right, what's wrong, what's going to make us happy. So you could say he's serving us like this patient wife with this with a difficult husband. <laughs> who's saying, you know, this is a good idea, this is not a good idea. And he's serving us, giving us uh, sun, water, food. He's even giving us the minds and bodies that we desire. So we see the patience of women, not only with husbands, but also with children. So even women who are not patient with their husbands or other men are often patient with children, especially young children require mothers to have a lot of patience. Right? You have to repeat something thousands and thousands of times for Krishna, for children to learn even the simplest things. Right? So many times repeat, let's wash your hands, say please, say thank you, don't hate your brother. Right? And, and children want to hear also and watch and, and do the same thing thousands of times. You, know, you read them a book and then they say again and you read it to them and they say again and you read them the book. And they say, again, you throw them in the air and catch them. And they say, again. And there has to be a lot of patience to do the same thing thousands and thousands and thousands of times with little children. Also, children cause a lot of mischief. Uh, just they're playful and they're curious and they're causing trouble. Right? <laughs> the other day, my, uh, my daughter was watching her two-year-old grandson. And she was also teaching a class to the Gurukul on Zoom. And he was in the other room and he was being very quiet. And so she's just thinking, oh, that's good. He's being very quiet. And then when she went there, there was a vase of flowers on the table. And he had, he had taken all the flowers, little, little flowers that were like on bigger flower balls. And he'd taken all the flowers off. And there were just flowers everywhere. 
right? And that takes a lot of patience, right? To, to clean up their messes and, and deal with them. And yeah, I, I read a story one time about this woman who had triplets. And again, they were really quiet for a while and she came and they had found a gallon jug of oil in the kitchen and poured it out on the floor. And they were splashing in the, in the oil. So a lot of patience to deal with, with children. Uh, and this, this patience that women have is Krishna. Right? And Lord Brahma compares Krishna's patience to that of mothers. He says, just like the, the mother, the pregnant woman is patient with the little baby kicking inside the abdomen. So in the same way, uh, Krishna is patient with us. Uh, we surrender gradually. We get faith gradually. We may kick him in the meantime, and he's still very patient. Okay, so I think we're going to go on now to the unit descriptions of the universal form. So we've looked at how we can understand Krishna in the elements of this world, how we can understand Krishna in the things he says, I am, in the Bhagavad Gita. And now we're going to look at the descriptions of the universal form from various places in the Bhagavatam. So this is from the second canto of the Bhagavatam, eighth canto, at various places where the Lord is described as the universal form. So let's see, what are we going to do here? Okay. In his nostrils, the wind. So the wind is blowing away smog and pollution and it can spread, it can also spread pollution and spread wildfires. But in any case, the wind is bringing some sort of a change. And this wind is Krishna taking a breath through his cosmic nostrils. So in the cosmic nostrils of the universal form is all the wind that is blowing on all the planets. So on a hot day, right, we open the doors, we open the windows, and we're like, oh, I get some relief with the wind. But sometimes the same wind brings difficulty, right? Sometimes the wind is putting freezing cold. It seems to go into our bones, and I put very warm clothes on. But both of the welcome breezes and the suffering wind are really the Lord's air going through his nostrils. And our fortunes and misfortunes dance on that wind like, like a pearl that's right in the center of Krishna's nose that's moving back and forth with every breath. So as Krishna's breathing, this little pearl is, is moving. And this breath, again, it can be something we're enjoying, something we're not enjoying. And we may not understand at that moment why the same wind uh, sometimes is favorable and sometimes isn't. But if we feel the wind, we know that we're right there by the breath of the Lord. Okay. The trees of the hairs are his body. So. When we walk through a forest, maybe we walk on a tree bordered street next to a forest, it's surrounding us with these tree hairs that are in Krishna's body. And we can get an, a sense that we're walking on the body of the Lord. Now, we know we're not supposed to put our feet on Krishna's form. That, in one sense, that's very disrespectful. But as the, as the Lord is the universe, we can't really avoid putting our feet on his body. So if the trees are his bodily hairs, right? Like we have little bodily hairs. We might have some little insect walking on these hairs. So when I'm walking through the trees, I'm walking on Krishna's body. And, and we can really feel that intimate connection with him, right? We're, we're like this little tiny creature that's walking on our own body. But, you know, unlike a little creature that I might be, get off, get off, okay? But for Krishna, we're his very intimate friend. Right, we're part of him, and we can we can feel how how loved we are by him that he's letting us walk on his body, and we gain respect for the trees, the ground, and a relationship with the Lord's form. Uh, okay, we can do some more about about hairs here. So on the hairs of his body are all the drugs and herbs. So if we can all look at our arms for a minute and we have this soft, short carpet of bodily hair on our arms, right? And this hair keeps us healthy. It helps to regulate our body temperature, um, increases the touch sensations of our skin. 
helps us to feel when there's some, you know, insect crawling on us that might hurt us. And our hairs help with the health of our body. So Krishna's hairs gives health to the whole creation. His hairs are medicinal. They cure disease. They realign the body and mind of the inhabitants of the universe. So I'm sure that many of us drink herbal teas. We make plant herbs. We harvest them. Um, in my daughter's garden, she has mint, cilantro, all different sage, all different kinds, rosemaries. Right. And when we use these herbal medicines, when we use even when we use pharmaceuticals that are derived from herbs, we can think, oh, these herbs, they're fragrant, they're balancing, they're curing, they're relieving our difficulty. This is the Lord's bodily hairs. This is the Lord's bodily hairs. As Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakur describes in Madhuriya Kadambani, how a devotee on the platform of Prema feels ecstasy at the fragrance and taste of the Lord. And we smell and taste something of Krishna whenever we cook with herbs, whenever we eat food prepared with herbs, or when we walk through an area where they're planted, right? When, we, when we're filled with this, this appreciation for Krishna, oh, Krishna, how nice you smell, how wonderful you smell. Okay, what else should we do here? Oh, this is a nice one. On his bosom, Ritam and Satyam. So in 328.25, Lord Kapiladev says, the yogi should concentrate his mind on the Lord's nipples, which resemble a pair of the most exquisite emeralds. So on this part of the body of the Lord's universal form are Ritam and Satyam. So on the upper portion of one's chest is where we hold those who are dearest to us and embrace, right? We embrace people here. So on this part of the Lord's form, the Lord cherishes two parts of speech. One is speech that is true in the sense of seeing the spiritual reality everywhere and in everything. And the other is speech that is true and pleasing. This pleasure comes from a connection with Brahman, with the spiritual. Whenever we have an awareness, of the spiritual equality of all beings. And when we speak with that awareness of connection and equality, then we are resting on the Lord's bosom. Isn't that nice thing? Okay. Similarly, when we present such spiritual realization and truth in poetic and pleasing ways that bring pleasure to those who hear us, the Lord is holding us to the shining emerald jewels on his upper chest. Therefore, when we speak in these ways, we are respectfully and tenderly held in Krishna's embrace. And we have special thanks to Hari Parsha and Prabhu uh, for giving us information from the 11th Canto verse and commentary about this aspect of the Lord's universal form. Ah, the ocean is his waist. This is a nice one for those of you listening from New Zealand. Most of you listening are from New Zealand as you're surrounded by ocean. So the ocean is the waist of the Lord. So the oceans link large continents and thus act as if a waist between one continent as a chest and another as hips. You could even think of that, the ocean between the North Island and the South Island or the ocean between Australia and New Zealand. So you think that that's the waist of the Lord and one big mass of land is his chest and one is his hips. Hmm? So one's waist is flexible, able to move in many ways. And similarly, the ocean's water shift and bend in contrast to the land on its borders. Walking near the ocean, the swaying of the waves, crashing sometimes to our right and sometimes to our left, seems like Krishna's waist turning and twisting in a dance. The sometimes fast, sometimes slow movements also are like dancing that changes in beat and speed and rhythm according to changes in music. Like a belly dancer ripples the abdomen, so the ripples and eddies in the ocean are the dance moves of the Lord. Like a waist holds the upper and lower body together, the oceans unite the continents and keep the planet together as, an, as a whole. As an attractive waist is a key, future, key feature in a body's beauty, so the ocean mesmerizes onlookers who find delight simply in gazing at the expansive, unfathomable depths. I was just reading in the sixth canto, where Kasyapa is praising his wife, Diti, by saying, Sumajima, you have a very nice waist. 
So these ocean wastes of the Lord are also very attractive. Okay. Um, we'll do one more of these. Uh, his shadow is death. So it's scary to go in a dark alley by ourself to a dark, lonesome underground parking lot where every shadow makes us believe there is danger. On a bright, sunny day, however, if we see if we sight a bird of prey, this is not edited. We sight a bird of prey soaring on the wind currents. We find it perhaps awe-inspiring, or at least we look twice. But for the tiny little mouse down in the grass, that bird shadow is most probably the last thing he will see. It's not surprising that death exists in Krishna's shadow. But how can Krishna have a shadow? He's the source of all light and illumination. The sun is a tiny fraction of his bodily rays. When we turn our backs to Krishna, it is we who are in shadow. That turning away becomes like a death to us. We forget our spiritual identity and our eternal life. For Krishna, the material energy is simply another one of his energies. Like a child plays with his shadow without fear. For Krishna, there is no death and illusion in his own shadow. All right, we have one more section here. So the first three sections, we started from Krishna's energy to Krishna. So we started from earth, water, fire, air, ether. And from there to Krishna, or we started from Krishna saying, I am this, I am that in the Bhagavad Gita, chapters 7, 9, 10, and 15. And from there to Krishna or the universal form, how different parts of the universal form are there in our world and remind us of Krishna. But in this last section, we're going to go from Krishna to his energy. So here we're looking at the 64 qualities of the Lord. And starting from Krishna's 64 qualities, what in our life and what in Krishna's energy reminds us of those qualities? So let's take ever youthful. So Krishna is beautiful at all angel ages, right? He's beautiful as a little baby, uh, but it's especially his youthful time that he's supremely beautiful. So during this age, all of his transcendental qualities have fully blossomed. And here he's engaged in the most ecstatic pastimes. So in Bhagavad Gita 1035, Krishna says of all seasons, he's the flower bearing spring, which is what it is here where I am, although in New Zealand, of course, it's the fall. Of the four seasons, spring is the ever exuberant youth of the world, like Krishna. Blossoms are the whispers of new young life, even after the most severe winter, whether in nature or in the supermarket or in the flower stall on the corner of the street. We can see these tiny treasures, these little jewels of Krishna's ever youthful quality. Youthfulness in anyone, human or animal, is attractive for its exuberance, innocence, idealism, hope, sensory strength and energy, feeling of invulnerability the way in which youthfulness draws our attention speaks to the Lord's eternal sweet youth. So whenever we see these aspects of youth in people and animals and the earth itself, we can remind it that Krishna is ever youthful. All right, what other qualities should we go to? Uh, a genius. All right. So having the last word is a concept that appeals to most people. Whenever we have a friendly whenever we have a friendly conversation, a formal debate, or an argument, very few people want their viewpoints and statements defeated by another person. The nectar devotion, the ability to refute all arguments with novel ones, is called being a genius. Krishna is the ultimate genius, but his defeating arguments were beneficial to all who listened, and in most cases unless he dealt with demoniac personalities, the other person actually enjoyed being defeated by Krishna. For example, Srimati Radharani derives immense pleasure when Krishna plays clever word games with her. A very good discussion when we think in a sporting mood of newer and newer ways to bring up points and come to an understanding brings a sense of satisfaction. That pleasure is a little taste of the happiness Krishna feels from being an absolute genius. On almost any topic in the world, there are multiple logical options. Such is due to the genius of Krishna. Indeed, 
Oh, look, I picked one that would give credit to Rukmini, who may still be listening. Indeed, his ability to make his own existence neither proven nor disproven to us in this world, so that various views even complete atheism and find support is particularly evidence of his genius. So I know that's especially going to be of interest to Arjuna, who organizes this class, that Krishna is able to give the atheist logical arguments. Right? I mean, you have to have some logical arguments to be an atheist. So this is Krishna's genius, that he can give logical arguments to anyone. You can't actually prove or disprove the existence of God. All you can do is get lots of good evidence. All right, what other one should we have here? Um, forgiving. So a forgiving person is one who can tolerate all kinds of offenses from an opposing party. An extraordinary instance of Krishna's forgiveness was when Bhrigu Muni kicked the Lord's chest. Rather than getting angry at Bhrigu, the Lord apologized for the hardness of his chest and his failure to greet Bhrigu properly. It is often the case that parents in this world forgive us just as Krishna forgave Bhrigu. They are so focused on our happiness that they hardly notice our offenses. Rama gives the example, if we, if we talked about already, how a pregnant woman never takes offense when the child in her womb kicks her by stretching his or her legs. The grass we walk on shows this quality of forgiveness in the Lord's universal form. Although we press it down with our feet, it both cushions our feet and happily bounces back. A cork in water has the same forgiving nature. No matter how many times it's pushed into the water, it bounces back. We all appreciate being forgiven by those we love and we find peace and freedom in forgiving others, such that we wish them no harm despite their offenses against us. When we have these experiences, we can't remember Krishna. So I'm going to stop here. We've gone over some of the uh, meditations from Kamla Sita's and my book at, at relating to today's verse. And we're gonna go back. Let's go back to today's verse again. The presence of the Supreme Lord can be realized just as the sun is realized first as a reflection on water and again as a second reflection on the wall of a room, although the sun itself is situated in the sky. And Shri Prabhupada saying, a pure devotee can realize the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the reflection of his energy. So we've tried to do that today with a number of examples. We've tried to do that with the examples, again, of the gross material elements, of where Krishna says, I am in the Gita, of the universal form and Krishna's qualities. So we have just about five minutes if anyone has any questions or comments. Okay, someone in the chat. Can't wait to read your book. Well, I can't wait for it to be published too. I'm excited about it. We have some beautiful, beautiful artwork. I mean, just absolutely gorgeous artwork. I don't know if I could show you any of that. I could see if that's possible. In the meantime, does anyone else have a question? Hmm, resilience and forgiveness. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely a relation between those two. That if I can can't forgive somebody, then I'm, I'm beaten down by them. Actually, it was, that was a topic we studied a lot in graduate school, how people can be resilient, how some people go through trauma in their life and it just destroys them. And other people are able to bounce back. And a lot of the ability to bounce back has to do with resilience and forgiveness. How can we really, and another question, how can we really give restitution for Krishna what we have done? Um, it's pretty simple. Krishna just wants us to feel genuinely sorry. Uh, it, it's really pretty simple. It, it's not. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, let's see if I can show you a few of these pictures. Well, this is the some of the artwork that was that's being done for the book, all with calligraphy. And his bones are stacked, the great mountains. 
on his lips was greed. Yeah, I didn't talk about that one, did I? <laughs> when we talked there about the greed for chanting Hare Krishna. Okay, let's see. When is the book coming out? Um, that's really up to BBG Africa. We just got all the pictures within the last like two weeks. So right now it's going through their review board and it has to then have a final layout and design and proofreading. So I'm not sure. Uh, with this, with the present situation in the world, it's very hard to print books. That's, that's a difficulty. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was a very meditative style of artwork. Okay, well, thank you very much. Did you have this going over uh, Facebook Live or anything like that in addition to uh, Zoom? Yeah, that one person is wondering if you'll be sharing your notes. No. Okay, and um, I, I was wanting to ask you a question. Uh, many devotees take these points about how logic and debate can go either way and you can't prove anything with the debate to say we shouldn't engage in debate or shouldn't try to persuade people with logic. Can you comment on that? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, Krishna Das Kaviraj says that we should apply our logic to the philosophy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all of our acharyas have used logic to try to persuade people. Uh, you can't ultimately persuade people who don't want to be persuaded. That's a fact. And that's true whether you're using logic, whether you're giving out prasadam, whether you're whatever you're doing. If people don't want to be persuaded, they won't be persuaded. So that's always true. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't approach people through various means. Sometimes we're going to approach people through grand festivals and beautiful kirtans and you know, through scrumptious prasadam, and other times we're going to approach people through logic and philosophy. It depends on the person and the circumstance. First of all, we're supposed to use our gifts to spread Krishna consciousness. So if my gift is dance, then I'm going to spread Krishna consciousness through dance. If my gift is cooking, I'm going to spread Krishna consciousness through cooking. If my gift is logic and philosophy, I'm going to spread Krishna consciousness through logic and philosophy. And depending on uh, what different people appreciate, they're going to respond in different ways as well. All right, I have to end now. I have somebody trying to call me to help me with some stuff. And it is uh, the end of the class time. Thank you very much. Shula Prabhupada Ki Jai.